evening, everyone. Welcome to the Haggerty Museum of Art. I'm Susan Ron Henry. I'm the director and chief curator here at the Haggerty Museum of Art, and I extend a very warm welcome get it, to those of you who are able to join us here this evening. Thank you for coming out in the cold. I also send a warm welcome to those of you joining us on Zoom. We are joining together in community this evening um, in, in different shapes but in form, but still very much um, in community tonight. So we are here to celebrate the opening of three exhibitions that all explore our permanent collection. Uh, you may know or you may not know, a lot of people are surprised to hear that we actually have a collection with 10,000 works of art in it. Uh, no, they are not all of the walls. We have uh, extensive storage, but we, we really try to focus on sharing that collection with you on activating it in interesting ways and, and thinking a lot about what it means to be an academic art museum. Um, we are not a, a general art museum. We are really not here for art for art's sake. We are here to think about art as an instrument for creativity, for reflection, for thinking, for, for empathy, for all, all different kinds of things. And this particular series of exhibitions, you will see weaving through all of it um, a strand of inquiry, I would say, that is really asking you to be in dialogue with these exhibitions. You're sitting in a gallery housing an exhibition called Art at you answer, and this is a unique exhibition. I'm not sure I've seen one like it before because it's formed by a series of questions. Uh, those questions include, what is art? Who makes art? Where does art belong? How has art changed throughout time? And as you look around, and those of you who are on Zoom, we look forward to seeing you here. There are a series of interactive stations where we want you to answer those questions. We, we don't want you to just look. We really want you to, to get engaged and to think and get creative. So I, I really invite you to come and explore on your own uh, with this really interesting exhibition. I have a number of people that thank for this exhibition, beginning with Christine Fleming, who is our manager of community engagement, and Kay Antonelli, our art across curriculum educator. If we could do a round of applause wherever where you are for those two, especially for taking this assignment on. It's a very unique exhibition that I really works hard to adapt. We have a program for K-12 school, it's called Art Across Curriculum. And they worked hard to try to see what that would be like as an exhibition format, so it's very cool. So I want to congratulate and thank them. Uh, also our curator of collections and exhibitions, Amelia Layton, who wrote the labels that you see on the walls. So we have a designer, Dan Harrow, who makes everything look beautiful and fabulous at the museum. I thank all of them. Upstairs, I hope you'll have a chance to go see the exhibition called, pardon me, Exploring the Poor expanding our horizon. Um, we, this is, I think, the third in a series of exhibitions we have done where we invite Marquette faculty members who teach in the discovery tier theme of the Marquette core curriculum, in this case, the one called Expanding Our Horizon, to choose two works of art or one work of art and to write a reflection on it from a different perspective, whether they're physics, chemistry, philosophy. So I really invite you to go upstairs and take a look at that show. And for that show, I especially would like to thank um, those 10 faculty members, take a look at what they've written, take a note of where they're coming from. Uh, it's a commitment on their part, we're thrilled. Dr. Connor Kelly, who's director of the Marquette Core Curriculum, has been an incredible collaborator, and we are very grateful to him for his partnership. I want to thank our curator for academic engagement, Lynn Schuba, who does an amazing job of engaging over 50% of Marquette's undergraduate students here every single year through courses taught in the gallery. She worked on putting that exhibition together upstairs. Um, and maybe, maybe a hand for, for Lynn Schumo. Can we do it? Yeah. Um, she hates it, but she deserves it. <laughs> um, and again, thanking uh, Amelia Lane and Dan Carroll for the work on that exhibition. And in the third exhibition, we have this, um, our speaker this evening to thank for. Um, and we'll say more about that in a minute. But um, the show is called Maxine Cantor Wasteland Letters from Paracorum. And it's an exhibition of collections from a portfolio um, by that name, by an artist named Maxine Cantor. Um, it's created in the year 2000, and it features etchings with color engravings depicting his interpretation of everyday life in Russia. And this idea came to us when Reverend Ryan G. Dunn, to my right here, your left if you're looking at me, he's a member of our collections committee. And after the first meeting, he said, hey, I'm teaching a class on theology and horror. Do you have an exhibition I can work with? And we're like, A, can we take that class? And B, yes. So um, our team here responded by uh, suggesting that we show selections from this portfolio um, and that um, that obviously met the needs. We'll look forward to hearing more about that tonight. 
So I would like to, um, before I give, before I introduce him, I would like to thank um, someone else who was our partnering sponsor, Dr. Mary Ann Siderit. Mary Ann is not here tonight, but she might be on the Zoom, so wave to Dr. Siderit if we can. Um, she's been a really wonderful and important partner to us. She's a former faculty member who really shared our vision and our mission and helped us to make it happen. So thank you much, very much, Dr. Mary Ann Siderit. And one more round, one last round of applause for her. She deserves it. So we were thinking that so we've got these exhibitions of what would be kind of a fun thing to do on the opening night. And we thought continuing the theme of creative responses to the permanent collection here and engaging teaching and learning, which is what these shows are all about. What better thing to do than to bring on our most creative faculty partner probably, and that is Dr. Ryan G. Dunn. Um, he is assistant professor in the theology department here at Marquette University. He's also assistant department chair and director of undergraduate studies there. Um, he works at the intersection of philosophy and systemic theology, and he's published on Carl Rotter, Jean-Luc Marion, René Girard, uh, and his most recent work, trouble reading, take my glasses off, this is how you know you're getting old, forgive me, Robert. Um, uh, involved a substantial engagement with William Desmond's metaphysics. His dissertation, Spiritual Exercises for a Secular Age, question mark, William Desmond's theological achievement, argued that when read as a form of spiritual exercise, Desmond's philosophy can reawaken a sense of the transcendent. He has a PhD from Boston College, um, Reverend G. Dunn, SJ, PhD, I should say. He teaches courses including Foundations of Theology, Christian Discipleship, God, Sex, and Violence, and Evil, Horror, and Theology. I have your interest. Uh, his research interests include metaphysics of theology, phenomenology and theology, and theological aesthetics. And as I said, he has been one of our most successful uh, collaborators. So with that, I introduce you to Reverend Ryan G. Dunn, SJ, PhD. Thank you, Susan and Dr. Sideritz. <clears throat> I will probably answer from the psychology department after my talk, you will watch see me and make uh, space on your couch and we can figure out what's wrong with me. What is wrong with me and where does this exhibit and this course come from? For 42 years, just about every Sunday, well probably not every Sunday and certainly not in the early years, I confess at Sunday Mass that I believe in things visible and invisible. An awareness that the world of our senses is not all that there is, that there's more to reality than needs to be I think uh, that, that the line from Hamlet is evoked. At the same time, for as long as I can remember, every night before I go to bed, I have to make sure all the doors and closets and all drawers in my room are shut because. The monster I know it, that isn't in my closet still could get out. And I still, tonight, I will shut the closet door and I will make sure all the, the drawers are flush with one another out of fear. And maybe this course is my own opportunity to work through and to think constructively about fear. I have loved horror movies since I was a little kid. Not, not movies that relish in torture, hostile, friends or saw, but movies that made me wonder, what if that could happen? What if that were true? And maybe it is. Movies like The Exorcist, Friday the 13th, the later ones, the later Halloween, the Nightmare on Elm Street series, Hellraiser. All of these raise questions that I ponder regularly. What if there are levels of reality that are dark and malevolent and out to get you? And if you, if you look at box office receipts, it is obvious in the last 20 years Supernatural horror films, Paranormal Activity, Conjuring series, Annabelle. These movies have done extraordinarily well in the box office. 
And what that leads me to wonder is why? They're not particularly good movies. My thesis is that what attracts women and men to, and especially teenage boys, to these <laughs> movies is an implicit awareness of a metaphysical, theological world picture that is somehow being impinged or upon or impacted by a dark, malevolent force. So where in Christian theology, we are often, we will talk about seeking the transcendent and we're talking about God. My wager is that in horror films, what we are working with is sort of the photographic negative of theology. And this is the category I am calling the dark transcendent. And in an era of increasing skepticism of organized religion and religious engagement, I am willing to try to tread a dark and spooky and spectral itinerary in the hope of reawakening a sense of the divine. Because if we can ask people, why are you afraid of this? Or what is, what is it about this movie or this story that is provoking the sensation of fear? Maybe, just maybe, we can reawaken a sense of the true divine, the true transcendence, the light beyond dark transcendence. It's a wager, and I know I have several students in the group who will be embarking on this journey with me, I will be with them all semester, trying to work through shows on Netflix like Midnight Mass, Hellraiser, we have some other international horror films that I'd like to screen with them as well. Always probing, what is it about this film that is tapping into or tapping at the window of the imagination and threatening to get in? My hope is to turn this into a book that real people would read. Because apart from my mom, I don't think anyone bought my book. <laughs> and I would like it. I would like something that actually would fit the needs of a young adult, inquiring, but generally skeptical audience. One of the great resources that Marquette University has provided for me, four years ago this week, I interviewed at Marquette. Four years ago this week, it was five degrees, and I caught an Uber, went to Mitchell Airport, and flew to San Jose for my second interview at Santa Clara University. What was I thinking? <laughs> I thought that five degree weather was a blip. <laughs> nope, it's been forever. I knew that there was a museum here, and it has been one of my great privileges to work with, with our colleagues at the Haggerty. This is the hidden gem of Marquette. And I think it is the greatest teaching avenue um, that we have available to us. I was a chemistry major as an undergraduate. I still love chemistry. I don't, there's no theology lab. I get a church. Try to get people in the door of a church sometimes. But this I have found is the best theology lab I could ask for. And last January, I, when I had my insane idea for how to engage my students in a practice of contemplative beholding, and some of my victims are here from that class too. I wrote to Lynn Schumo and said, hey, is it possible that we could do something? I was thinking she'd give me wall space like this. She gave me this entire room, and we put together an exhibit on Robert Motherwell. And week after week, students came in, and they had to sit and stare at the same picture, not stare, behold, and gradually discover themselves to be be held by the work of art. And for 11 weeks, they had to write three to four page page, three to four page paper answering the same question about the same piece of art. What did you see? In the first three or four weeks, they were very good because the students could impose their interpretation on the paintings. And then the crisis hit. There was a break. No longer could they impose, no longer could they make up and conjure an interpretation. They had to sit, and they had to wait, and they had to hold, and they had to allow the painting to manifest itself from itself. They had to experience 
Revelation. This semester, it's my privilege, and again, I am so grateful to Lynn and to Susan and to Amelia and everyone who was so excited about doing something in collaboration, giving me yet another chance that we are going to exhibit 14 prints of Max and Cantor's Wasteland series. You know, it's a funny thing, really, to invite students to reflect on a wasteland, wasteland, or to even try to artistically capture what is a wasteland. It's a no place. How do you get your bearings when there are no landmarks that are of particular meaning in desolation and in darkness? Cantor will describe his project as being as capturing something of a between space. He writes there is a series of letters also that you can read. They're very long and often very dark. Writing a love letter to his beloved, Russia, in this case, he writes, you don't have to understand the wasteland or figure it out. You can't impose meaning on it. You just have to look at it with the same melancholy passion as the wasteland looks at you. The earlier you understand that you're one with it, the better. For the days will come when you'll merge with it. Very bleak horizon, and it doesn't get any rosier the further you read. It only gets darker. The students again this semester will write a series of essays, six in total, picking different pieces of art to engage with, asking again and reflecting on what they see. And my hope is that as we study the genre of horror, as we build up a theologically friendly world picture, that the bleak vision that Cantor captures of difficulty and pain and marginalization and oppression will begin to function as dark icons mediating an encounter with the divine that through darkness, they will come to know the light. It's all an experiment that I assortedly and with great glee get to inflict on them. But it's my conviction that a theology course's goal is not merely to inform, and thanks to the resources here at the Haggerty, we can allow art to perform and transform our students in the way that they see the world. And that is my hope that over the course of the semester, they will find their eyes gradually opening. And not unlike St. Ignatius, you know, we're now in the Ignatian year, 500 years ago, Battle of Pamplona in 1521. And then in 1522, 1523, Ignatius goes to Manresa as he's working out the order of the spiritual exercises. And he has a vision at the River Cardinaire. And it's not that he saw something, but he saw the world with new eyes. The inner eye of his intellect and his heart were opened and merged, and he began to recognize God's presence in everything, even the wasteland. And it is that form of vision that I want to invite our students to develop, an awakening of that inner eye, an inner eye of love, an inner eye that sees hope and hopelessness and to confront the faces of historical evil. We all know evil is not a theory. It is something that afflicts each one of us, something that has touched all of our lives, particularly in the last couple of years. Every day, we open up the newspaper, look at the Twitter or the Facebook, and we see this, this other. How do we find hope? We can't find hope by turning a blind eye to it. We have to look. We have to look carefully. We have to learn to behold reality with courage filled eyes. If you happen to pick up one of these lovely cards, oh, I, should, I was going to tell you all, you should look under your chair. Maybe one of you has won a card. I could be like the Oprah of the Art Museum. I could get you a matchbox. At the, on the back side, the 
line I have taken from Johann Baptist Baptist, a political theologian only recently deceased. What I am hoping to develop, not only for myself, but certainly for my students, is what he calls a mysticism of open eyes. A mysticism that has the courage and the ability to look at what so many in this world would rather look past and ignore. Cantor's exhibit does not allow us to turn away from the harsh reality of the world. It invites us to be whole and to be convicted and to act. Metz will give the German a root frog and on Ross, questioning back. Metz envisions part of the task facing us is to return to God again and again with our questions, not because God always gives simple answers, never gives simple answers, but that the divine calls forth our questions. And in another phrase, it's beautiful, lighten on God, suffering unto God, that we suffer the divine. We allow the divine transcendent one to transform every aspect of our lives. There's no part of ourselves left untouched when we wrestle, as Jacob did at the Javik Ford, the Holy One who comes at night. So maybe tonight you thought I was going to talk about all the scary things that rattle around inside my head. And we're going to do that all semester. We will watch scary movies. We will talk about the world pictures that they presume. We will tease out metaphysics, optimistic metaphysics, to say Thomas Aquinas. Who knew that Thomas Aquinas and Ford could go together? Let's hope they do. This is all an experiment. But what I'm more concerned is to move beyond the level of shock, beyond the level of popularity, and see the ways that Cantor's arts and these films can lead students, can lead inquirers on a radically transformative pilgrimage into the unknown expand their horizons, enlarge their minds, widen their hearts, and deliver on that different type of education that Marquette University promises parents and has to pay forward to the students. I mean, this is the privilege of what we are getting. We're gathered here tonight. It's a privilege to be here with you in person and online. Hi, Marilyn. Because this art is sacramental. All of this. All of this. And we get to teach our students. 60% of the students every year get to be drawn into a conversation with artists long and dead, with an art they might they can't make sense of. And they have to account for it. They have to stand before it and let it interrogate them. And maybe, just maybe, transform them. So that when they walk out after 15 minutes of beholding or after four years of regular visits, they're different people. They are the difference that we envision for, for our graduates. So at this point, I, I mean, I'm willing to entertain any question. I hope there's not questions. So if there's something you would like to know about the course or about the, uh, Cantor's art, we can go wherever you like. I guess I just saw tonight as an opportunity to start thinking out loud with my students and with all of you about what I should be doing for the rest of the semester.
um, in the 1950s, uh, an art critic named Michael Free Michael Free wrote an essay called Art and Objects. And it was a criticism in his, his mind, a negative criticism of minimalist art, which is art that you can think of as art that uh, at that time was being made. It was it reduced to its very essence, it was geometric form, it was thing of steel, it was just kind of uh, stripped of everything, but it's their essence. And he complained about that as being like, he said, it's not art, it's theater, because it's in there, it's waiting for you to come, and it's not complete until you participate in it. Um, and I think that I was sharing, I think that's what's so very powerful about that kind of art. And it's also something that I hear you referring as well, which is the way that you, you work and engage your students. So I think that there really is a strong overlap between the aesthetic experience and the educational experience that, that you are aiming to give here. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I think, you know, it's so, we can reduce education. I mean, you can read the Chronicle of Higher Education, and there's always these controversies about what, what does college, what is college for, what should it do? America Magazine today is running a piece by the theologian Charlie Kamosi about the future of Catholic higher ed. What will it look like in 10 years? And I, Derek Ritter even sent it to me this morning, uh, and I was grateful to read that. And I think one of the what is distinctive about what we can offer is, is not only the education of the whole person, body, soul, and spirit, but a retuning of the senses, a way of, of, of interacting with the world. Um, and you know, Catholics, we call that sacramental imagination. You know, the, the Catholic theology, it's not just thoughts that get put into your head. It's kneeling and bowing and incense. It's water, it's bread, it's wine, it's a handshake, and then it embrace. It's dunking a baby in water and it's saying, I do. And it's oil on the forehead of your dying relative. It's tangible, it's tactile, it's aesthetic. It's often ugly. It's dirty and life, because life is dirty and messy. And it's beautiful and sublime and joyous. I wanted to share this line just from Cantor. This, he writes, this is from his letter five. He writes this to Russia. At first, I tried to paint, and all my paintings were painted letters. Do you know how I painted? I wanted to describe how much I loved you, yet it turned out to be necessary to tell you about politicians, old women sitting on benches, stunted poplars. Otherwise, my account was incomplete and unconvincing. The blank sheet of paper that I had to fill became occupied and inhabited by the wrong things and the wrong people. That's how life is. It's full of chance people who came in for a minute and then stayed. In the, the letter prior to this one, history appears only when love is present. All the cantors work in as difficult as they are to behold, and they are, if you have not yet gone upstairs, please do. They're challenging. But they're not written out of necessarily a nihilistic drive, but they are written out of love. And it's love that sees the particularity, the thisness, this. You know, like they say that mom, new moms can tell the smell of their baby, that they can take 12 t shirts and the mom knows that child, this is my child. I think they all smell terrible, but the moms know, the nose knows. The celebration of this, this, the smell of love, the taste of love, the taste of the beloved. Mystical poetry in Christian tradition, celebrating all the senses. And we're, it's best if we do not offer that as an opportunity for our students to engage with. The full, the full body, embodied experience of theological reflection. It's not just a discernment in theory, it's a discernment in the practice of daily life. Theology should be a way of life, not just one more course that we add on because we have to. And if, if we can encourage our students to, to, to embrace that way of life, they'll be richer for it for the rest of their lives. Dr. Denson. Very 
I think that is the take. I think he's gets some. This is art as a mirror, and he, he is not blinking, and he's not harsh. He wants people to see this is what we've done to our own people. The the letters are jostled back and forth between the beloved of Russia or dearest friend Europe, and you sense the bitterness towards Europe. You have made our people immigrants. You have you have lessened us in a way. Because who, for so many in Russia, who are we? We're not them. And oh, yeah. Um, this one. Yeah. You know, and this is what's fascinating, isn't it? This is an, I mean, this is a hard look. This is, this is not Pollyanna mysticism of, oh, sweetness and light. This is the dark reality of human history held in your hand. I mean, it's art that disturbs, it's art that distresses, not unlike a good war movie. Something that threatens, that poses the opportunity of a breakdown in the neat order of the world we think we dwell in. It threatens to transform it forever. Others ago. I knew the topic when I came in, the symptomatic evil. Yet before I went upstairs, I walked down the mirror. How do you embrace, how do you include a painting like that? No, that's excellent. If you think you pointed it out, I used to, I was very deliberate, and I thought it was a clever with Lynn. Asymptomatic, I mean, how many of us we know the asymptomatic COVID carrier? Uh, with no symptoms, but at the same time, every one of these paintings points out asymptomatic, a symptom, a sign of evil's perdurance in the world. And then you look over, and here you have uh, David Barr's uh, The Lamentation of Mary over the body of Christ with angels. And it's beautiful and terrible at the same time because why is Jesus executed for being human? In an inhuman world, his humanity threatens those around him and continues to threaten us today. He wasn't killed because he was the Son of God, he was killed because we are, but we are fundamentally allergic to the authentic human condition. He shows us what that condition looks like. And David Bar uh, does not, I mean, if you could. Our webcam lookers could see the corpus of Christ, the, the land blood pours from the ribs, bluish, marked, pierced, broken. There's beauty and darkness. Christianity cannot close our eyes to one or the other. We can't just have Easter Sunday all the time. The other eye is always on Good Friday. The other eye always has to be on our the way we're implicated in perpetuating Good Friday. Who do we crucify? How are we part of a crucified crowd? How are we allergic to humanity? How is that a symptom of evil within each of us that needs to be healed? In this item, the, in the blurb on the back, I do talk about this as an exercise of discernment of growing in one's capacity to see more clearly and to judge more deliberately and to find wholeness. And that's where 
Theologically, we will find holiness. Um, that makes me think about a thought that I've been having as well, which is about the act of looking. Um, and I was going to ask all of you to think about what you hear from the work of art. What is that experience like for you? Um, there is actually research in this, and we're going to be doing a program on this right now, that is called Stages of Aesthetic Development. And it talks about, it doesn't matter how old you are, it talks about beginning years, stage one years, the approach of work of art is when we think about children. Children come and hear this the work of art, they immediately enter it. They enter the narrative as part of that. They, they have a personal association. They do a play story about that reminds me when I went to church, or that reminds me of my very father. They, they are thinking there, and they have a work of it. They have a picture of it. And they were playing the story. They don't question it. As we look more, we progress and start to back up. Um, the stage two the other day, that's an example. There's a, that's not art. That, that, that's not art. That, that, we can't do that. We have questions of skill, especially of value. Um, we're not trusting our initial reaction to what we're wanting to kind of put our framework on it. The next stage is the art historian. Well, that's really from the impression of stage, it's a little bit low, et cetera, but it is categorization. And it's only when you progress beyond that that you kind of reintroduce yourself back into the act of looking and you align yourself to have a personal connection with it. So it's actually sophisticated looking, like you're talking about, like your students are able to you know, look at it and then close their own sort of stories and looking for stories and it's abstract and trying to find something representational, right? Um, but then what you're doing is you're bringing them along that book and you're able to introduce the intuitive um, into it. So that's what I have to see as well. I would go to bed Jesuit jail if at the end of the semester I said to one of my students, you're a real looker now. <laughs> You know, one of the things you have, Aristotle, Aristotle and in his ancient philosophy, they said, looking what if we think of looking at this two dimensional, I'm seeing it, it's over there. For Aristotle and company, to look was to be in Congress. It was, it was an act of being connected, like the, it's almost the finger of the eye stroking and touching and I mean, very intimate. We've lost, we very much lost a sense of that. But then you look at, look at our own Ignatian heritage of how Ignatian contemplation works, inviting the participants, the one who's praying, to enter into the scene, not as a casual bystander looking at you know, a movie, but as an agent. I see what Jesus is wearing, I see how he looks, I see the, I think, and the smells and the touch, what am I wearing, what's going on around me, and how, did this, how does the story unfold? And I find that it's not just a story, but it's my story that's becoming my story that it changes. And I stop, it's not, I'm not a disciple in theory, I'm a disciple because in my prayer and in my presence, I have come to know and to love and pledge myself to serve the one who has set me free, because the one who has set so many others free, and I want to be liberated too. So the liberation of the imagination sets people, I have spiritual freedom, Set them forth. It's a free from the things that hold us back and set us free for mission. And that, I mean, if we can provide that as a gift to, to our students and to you know, people who visit, how do we develop that, imag that Ignatian imagination through art? It's an opportunity every, every time. Any kind of that with something that you see people spending more time being able to look at the work of art. You just you see the shuffle in the gallery, and that's because they don't want to get it wrong. You know, that's what you do when you want to answer. You tell me what this is about, and then I'll look at it. Oh, yes, I see that. Where I look at there's no way you want to just open yourself to it and trust yourself to look. That's what we're holding. If I can share, I, I, I know Jesuit Jail is going to be doing a
beauty wasn't in just her eye of the beholder, but she discovered her own beauty and she was beheld. And she experienced that. And I will tell you, her paper, the tone of the paper, the style of the paper trans, it was a 180. The next three or four papers, totally different kid, totally different kid. I mean, that was an awakening. That's, and that's an awakening. Oh, did you? It's something mysterious, it's something very difficult to name. 
something that can't be answered, but that our capacity even today takes to recognize and respond to instances of evil. We've not been numbed to it. So there's something still very much alive in the human soul and the human spirit that calls us to respond to it and to work against it. So I think there is something instructive, but it's not a deep, clean lesson at all. It's, this is where discernment, engaged discernment, is, is required. I love the silence. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Any other, any other questions or comments or contributions for our presentation? Well, this is Johnny Zaggy. We're going to run our house for the three. So that's really nice. I would invite you to 